So I'm going to go ahead and get a start here. I've got uh, quite a few slides I want to get through and uh, an awesome little video to show as well. So I want to get through our time. Uh, so I recognize a few of you guys out there. Hi, Dimitri. Uh, I am Pete Moss. I work in Seattle in uh, one of the newer Unity offices. I'm a field engineer in simulation and visualization, uh, much like Robert, who just spoke. Uh, we're colleagues. Uh, so today, I get to talk about um, something new and fancy and shiny, something no, no one here has ever seen before, something that I only built just a few months ago. Um, so it's kind of fun. Uh, we call it cluster rendering. What is cluster rendering? There's a lot of things it could be, but uh, the basics are that it's a way to sync multiple players on a network so that they're all playing the same scene with the same state simultaneously. There's a master server. There's a lot of um, slaves as well that uh, play the content. And so we sync them over a LAN, uh, a LAN, and we have to sync the frame rendering uh, times as well as all of the simulation state. And so I'll, uh, during the course of this talk, I'll talk about some of the techniques that we use for that. It's all automagical under the hood in typical Unity fashion. And the nice thing is, with a technology like this, it allows us to do something with Unity that we can't do with a normal single machine system. We can support much larger displays. We can support uh, displays that wrap around you. Uh, one such example is a cave. Um, perhaps many of you have heard of these or even uh, used them. Um, we can also support power walls. This isn't actually one of our demos. I kind of wish it was, because it looks kind of cool. But uh, I like uh, the idea that you can see the, the grid really well in this image. Um, natively, we support caves and power walls. But the beauty is we built the system to support any type of configuration that you guys like. Um, I'm not going to go into the custom configuration, but I just want to keep that in your mind that that is a possibility. So as I said, the players need to be networked. Uh, they need to be networked over LAN. Uh, all the testing that we've done so far has used uh, gigabit LAN. Uh, you know, maybe you could route this stuff over the internet, but your frame rate's going to be really bad. Uh, so we use the client-server architecture. Our server is a special uh, player. Uh, it doesn't actually render the scene. It renders information. Uh, it also accepts input uh, and does some special jobs. So it's not normally something that would be uh, visible on the cluster. Um, that's all the clients that you're going to see. So the clients are they're driving screens. Uh, they, are, they are locked, frame locked to the server timing. Uh, so the server, and I'll go into details here in a moment on how that works. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that to make this work and make it work as well as possible, we try to leverage open source technology. Uh, we try to leverage the best of the networking technology. So for this, we're using 0MQ. Uh, it's a really nice library. It makes it, our original solution with uh, custom sockets uh, was about 1,000 lines long. Uh, by switching to 0MQ, we, our, our final solution is about 200 lines long. It simplified most of the work, uh, made it much, much easier. And the nice thing is it allows us to offload that mental baggage onto someone else's shoulders and let them make it better, and we can exploit uh, the adv advances that are made. Um, and uh, one of the nice things as well is just that it's so flexible and so configurable. Um, it allows us to do much more than uh, we would be able to do just in our own custom socket configurations. This uh, next slide, for the more visually oriented learners in the room, uh, basically describes how the network architecture works. Um, there's a separation on this slide between the workstation and the master, the, the two left boxes. Uh, those don't necessarily have to be on different machines. And as I go through and, and show you the UI, you'll see uh, that that doesn't have to be that way. But it's built so that it could be that way, so that you could have a development machine uh, that develops the content, and then you deploy onto uh, a large cluster of uh, network machines. Perhaps that development machine is the server. Perhaps it's not. And this only shows two slaves. Uh, we've run 
many more than two in testing. Uh, we have a client that has somewhere close to 100. I really want to have some time on their rig so that I can see how well it really works. Perhaps someday we'll get there. So I spoke about synchronization. It's important with these uh, nodes that they all do the same thing at the same time so that when you see a scene rendered across multiple screens, it looks coherent. Uh, things don't pop in magically in one that don't exist in another. Cre a character doesn't walk from one screen and then vanish in the next screen and then appear in the third screen over or anything like that. So maintaining state is a critical aspect of this. Uh, we've actually broken it down into uh, two steps. Uh, the first is the master sends a little signal with uh, current frame timing information from the time manager, sends it out to all of the um, slaves on the system, and all the slaves render. And when they're done rendering, they send a little message, an ACK message back to the master that basically says, hey, I'm done, uh, I'm ready to render again, what you got for me? And that's basically described here in text. So this loop happens again and again. It has to happen for every frame. Uh, so one of the downsides to this, if you don't have a very robust network, uh, your frame timing is going to be as bad as the worst node on your cluster. So that includes network latency and any uh, speed performance issues that that machine may have. Uh, so it's something to consider. Uh, I think most people doing uh, cluster rendering like this are gonna use very well-matched uh, computers. <clears throat> Uh, and they're also going to try to optimize uh, the LAN for uh, transmission of this data back and forth. <laughs> Excuse me. When we talk about synchronizing the state, there's several things that we have to synchronize. Uh, there's a lot, actually a lot going on under the hood in Unity, and solving this particular problem uh, was one of the more challenging because Unity is huge. It's like a million lines of source code. There's a lot of places that you gotta look for synchronization da data. Uh, so it took several days of just pouring through the source code and trying to find little areas where we had missed something and hacking in support for uh, uh, doing binary transfer of, of this new little state data element and, and so on. But what we've uh, been able to do is reduce it down to these, uh, this bullet list right here. So time manager obviously has to be synced, um, not just what time is it, but what is our frame count, what's our delta time, uh, all that information. So anything from the time manager, uh, we retrieve and we send to all the slaves, and we do that every frame. So when we send the, the signal that uh, we are ready for the nodes to render, uh, the data element we send with that is the time manager data. Uh, but we also have to sync physics. We also have to sync input. Uh, you wanna have uh, your scripts that are expecting input get the same data on the same frames so that they can do the same thing at the same time. Um, so we always have to sync input data. Uh, animations are another special case, and I have some notes later in a later slide that talk about uh, techniques to make your content work best on a cluster. Uh, animations require a little bit of care because they may not work out of the box right away. Um, because uh, I, I believe the default is for animations to not always run, and that could be a problem. Uh, if your camera isn't looking at an at a animated object, and then it walks onto the screen, it may be animated when it gets onto your screen, but it's not actually moving uh, with the animations when it's off your screen. But there's an easy checkbox to make that work. Uh, and of course, random numbers. Uh, anytime you generate random data inside your scripts, you don't want uh, all, of this, all of the nodes on the cluster to, to come up with their own random number. Um, I mean, maybe you do, but you should do that on purpose, uh, not uh, have that as a, a negative byproduct of our system. So we also sync random number data. <coughs> I'd like to move now and talk about the UI and the interface that we have developed. Uh, this is, um, is that a little fuzzy? It's a little yeah, it's a little blurry, sorry. I didn't realize that. Um, we have, as part of this, it's not just about syncing and it's not just about um, keeping state and all of that, but it's also about making uh, the system easy to use. Um, it, it may just be the quality of my graphics here. 
Um, but uh, so our first uh, distribution system that we have is a web-based system. Uh, and you'll notice that there's two frames on this slide. Uh, on the left side is a list of all the apps that all like games, simulations, whatever you want to call them, that have been built and that are available uh, to send and sync across the network. Uh, and on the right-hand side, um, the drop-down uh, above the green button is, has selected the cars demo. And you can see the, all the nodes that are currently available on the network below that. So the nice thing is with this, uh, I believe we use our sync in the background. Um, so we send the data out across the, the network. Uh, and we can also uh, get them started at the same time. This is a web interface to make it easy. That way the content creation computer does not have to be used. It can be a more general purpose computer uh, for deploying to your uh, nodes on your network. However, uh, we have a built-in interface as well that's part of the Unity editor. It does something very, very similar. And I'll just show that here. This is a little window. This is our cluster control, our cluster controller. Uh, and the idea is that uh, it has the same information in it. You can um, push uh, a current build out to all of your clients. Uh, you can start the simulation on all of your clients. You can also stop the simulation on all of your clients. So all of this can actually be affected from within the editor directly. You don't have to use any third-party tools. We, as part of this, developed a new asset type. It's a binary asset type. We call it a camera rig. It's a very original term. I'm going to have to go back and fix a lot of my old demos because I use that term everywhere. Um, but now it has a special meaning. So a camera rig is a multi-view camera. You can think of it that way. Um, so every system, every node on the, on the network, it knows not only information from the camera rig, but it also knows what index it is in the network. So it uses this index information to get the right camera information out of the camera rig. The camera rig, uh, you can think of it as a, like a really, really wide uh, camera, or maybe really, really tall. It depends on what your configuration is. Uh, but basically what we do is with some very simple little drop downs, um, we can set it up so that all the frustums are calculated automatically. These are typically going to be asymmetrical frustums unless you have a very symmetrical uh, viewing rig, like a cave. Uh, but for a power wall, you want all the focal centers of all your cameras to be at the same exact point in space. But they're all looking different directions. And when they do that, you don't want the frustums to collide kind of in the background. I actually have an awesome graphic that I realized I should have dropped in here. It would explain this point perfectly, but I forgot it. Uh, but the idea is that you want non-overlapping frustums. So if, to make that happen, you, they generally have to be warped uh, to be um, non-symmetrical. So the normal camera frustum is symmetrical. These can warp in different ways. Um, and this, this, uh, this uh, camera rig asset actually makes that easy. And we have some drop downs. You'll notice the cave is currently selected. So our basic types are in there, but we have the ability to do any sort of custom configuration as well. And the nice thing about the camera rig asset, I think uh, that's also worth mentioning, is because it's a binary asset, it plays really nice with Unity's uh, asset pipeline. So if you have a custom hardware system set up, I mean, how often is that going to change? Once a year, maybe? Got in some new screens, you're going to add them? So you can go and uh, get one camera rig asset that matches your system, and you can deploy that into each project. You only have to do this once. It's a binary asset that you can drop in. And as long as you, the actual hardware configuration doesn't change, uh, that asset should be useful in many, many projects for you. The cluster renderer script is an uh, enhancement script. You'll notice that this is on a camera object. Uh, and some of the kind of built-in things have been turned off on this particular demo. But what you'll see at the bottom is a cluster renderer. And the most important thing I want you to notice is that the rigs element is that camera rig uh, asset dropped in, into the uh, slot in the inspector. Uh, and there's also some ability to change like what your index is and things like that. Generally, the index is assigned when it's deployed and started like through the command line. Uh, 
Um, however, uh, there's some simple overrides for that, uh, which might be useful for debugging or just kind of forcing your will on the simulation that you have. So here's a view in the editor. I'm gonna show you this uh, demo here in a moment, this cars demo. Um, but the idea is you can see that uh, right now we have a, I'm sorry, it's a little blurry, um, but we have a camera rig selected in the lower part with the camera rig uh, inspector uh, over on the right. And you'll also see the uh, cluster controller uh, just below the video uh, preview screen. And if I select the uh, camera, um, you can see that uh, it has the same elements uh, as I showed a moment ago in the blow up. Uh, what, one thing that we tend to do, and if you look in the uh, project view in the upper left, um, we tend to, for content, uh, group this camera rig as a child of some other element. That way you can move one element around the world and all the orientations and everything stay the same. So when you guys get access to this technology, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we'll probably have a document that uh, gives some tips on best use. Um, but let's not talk about that right now. Let's watch an awesome video demo. And I'm just gonna talk over this a little bit while it plays. My buddy Paul Tam in Singapore, who I worked with on this project, he made this video. Uh, probably many of you have seen this car driving demo. What I'd like you to notice is the, um, what happens when data crosses from one screen into another. Uh, so not just the landscape, but like the butt end of that car and the shadow of the car, that it's consistent across both screens. The physics is driving the car. There's animations, there's a lot of rendering of geometry. Um, Paul's really not a very good driver, uh, so don't trust his driving ability by this uh, demo. But uh, he, he's very good at setting up hardware. So we have five screens running uh, this simulation and uh, it should permit a much, much wider field of view for racing enthusiasts. I really like when he's coming around the corners and you can see the car tail end on two screens and the shadow crossing it. Now he's got a kind of a semi-circular array for these screens. This is one of the custom layouts that I said is possible. Um, this could be all the way around him. This could be a full 360. This could be a dome. Um, it could have you know 500 screens potentially in it that are all blended perfectly. There's a lot of tech that you could throw at this, uh, and uh, this cluster entry technology for Unity should make uh, most of that work quite well. Sorry for the shaky camera. I don't know if the photographer is in the car that's flying through the scene. I think that's enough of that. Okay, content creation. The nice thing with our system is most stuff should just work right out of the box. So you take your simulation, you build a camera rig, uh, you hit deploy and you go, you're good to go for most things. It's when you start getting a little crafty and a little creative that problems can creep in. Um, I did say uh, regarding the second bullet point that uh, the animations need to be set to always animate. Uh, this is actually something I noticed in the very first demo that I made. We started this uh, project during Hack Week uh, back in May. It's this thing we do at Unity where we don't do normal work and we get together and make awesome stuff for a week with people we've never worked with. And that's actually where uh, the cluster rendering, this current iteration came from. Uh, but one of the first things I noticed when I built the demo is I had a, a really awesome guy running through the scene I'm just gonna fight a dragon, and, but his default pose is a T-pose. Well, he had a cannon on his arm, so he could shoot. So we had him walking through the scene and shooting straight ahead. The thing is, he was actually teleporting through the scene in a T-pose, so of course he was shooting off to the side instead of in the front, and we kept looking at it thinking, what's wrong here, what's wrong here? Why is, why is the aiming so bad, suddenly? Uh, and then we discovered it's because he's actually aiming to the right. So we went and checked one little checkbox and everything worked perfectly after that. Um, the only other thing I'd like to mention, and this isn't something that I think is common, but um, I have seen user code that uh, tries to take advantage of the knowledge of the calling system 
and do something special or like deactivate a script if it's cold. Um, if you start getting really creative with that, you may have to get a little less creative because you, things may get cold at unexpected times. Uh, and you wanna make sure that when things are staying in state that even at the scripting level, you're thinking about this idea that there's a lot of things going on in parallel. But like I said, most of the stuff should just work right out of the box. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up here. I'll have a Q&A in a moment. I did want to, first of all, say some thanks. Um, I'm a new guy here at Unity. Uh, there's actually quite a few of us new guys in Unity this year. Um, but one of the coolest things that I ever got to do, as I mentioned a moment ago, was do Hack Week. They sent me to Copenhagen um, for two weeks, actually. And um, I got to work with a whole lot of awesome people. I'm convinced that Unity is the best of the best, so I'm just, I'm amazed at the, the, the quality of people I get to work with, and I'm also amazed at Unity for allowing such activities. It's not common that uh, they want you to take a week off of work and go have fun. Uh, so I had a lot of fun working with that, and I'd also like to give a special thanks to Paul Tam. Uh, he and I have worked very closely together. He's on the Singapore team. Uh, he's also totally saved my bacon on this demo because some of the screenshots he had to get for me because I was very inept and was not able to finish them in time. So at Oh, dark 30 this morning, Paul was online in Singapore helping me out. Um, so if he's watching the video, thanks a lot, Paul. Okay, uh, Q&A. I'm looking into some of this stuff myself. Um, I would imagine that assuming you have the right sort of hardware, there's nothing preventing you from doing a cluster, quote unquote, over localhost. Just get like multiple Unity windows with different content from the same scene? Yeah, indeed. Um, a cluster means a lot of things. And one of the things it possibly means is a whole bunch of instances running on the same computer. That's actually how we started testing. So localhost is just another network connection. Should be no difference, except of course now your machine's running multiple instances. It might not run all of them as well. Any other questions? Dimitri, step right up. Hi, Pete. Uh, very cool demo. Thanks a lot for showing that. Um, my question is basically um, about the direct, kind of like about the thinking that went into this. And is the idea is the idea to um, up the visual quality? If you if you, let's say you're talking about the power wall, with with cluster rendering, do you want to just up the um, visual quality shown on each screen? Because and and how how would that compare to pure hardware solutions like AMD Ifinity, for example? Um, I think part of the idea is to up the quality, maybe, depending on your scenario. So you could do a very detailed camera that's zoomed way in and showing a lot more detail on any particular screen. Um, I think the bigger thing is more about the screens that are not flat. I mean, the power wall is one idea, but it's not really the, the thinking behind why we developed this. Um, it's a very easy to do thing now that we have it. Uh, but that's not really the core. The core is I want to I want to have a full wraparound simulation. I want to walk into a space and I want to feel immersed in the game world. Uh, and I think that that's really the the biggest focus of this. Oh, I see. So as opposed to hardware solutions that would just do flat big screen. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, most screens are flat, right? So if you go for uh, like a single screen solution um, for focusing on quality and things like that. I mean, that's not really what this is, this is built around. Um, clearly, you know, like a giant power wall in Times Square that's displaying advertising content, they want to do really huge and they want to have it really high res. So this might be an application for that. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the only way to go about doing that, but this, is, this could be used in a, in a scenario like that to give you higher res, perhaps from a distance where you're not right next to the screen. Uh, any other questions? I've probably got time for about one more. TBD, yes, ETA, TBD. So how do you see the scaling for this working? Uh, given th that you're using zero MQ and so forth, uh, is this a squared scaling? How, how, how far do you think this can scale before you start running into frame rate issues? Well, uh, there's definitely gonna be limitations because of the network, uh, because your you know, massive amount of packets are going out all the time. Um, we haven't really done any analysis like that. Part of it, the problem is that we just don't have um, a dedicated hardware asset like that to use. Um, we are using uh, a couple of uh, close customers right now to do some kind of alpha slash beta level testing. And one of the things that we're doing is getting feedback from them on how well the rigs work. Um, and also one of the things that I'd like to do, hopefully in the next few months, is be able to take trips out to client sites uh, so that I can see firsthand how it's working better. 
Um, one of the nice things is Paul in Singapore uh, actually works right next to one of our customers and has had the chance to go and uh, view these things firsthand. So the more we can do of that, the more feedback we get. I mean, we, we got pretty good ideas, but we know we don't know everything. So one of the things is we really want to get feedback from users. Um, at some point, we'll probably enter this into a more widely available beta. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's still a little close to our heart right now, just because we're still trying to work out some of these issues so that we have less problems later. And I believe that is it. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Thank you. Thanks.